What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV. All right, so before I get into this video, I want to give a shout out to two of my subscribers for their contribution to the channel, Carlton and Joshua. All right, they both contributed to my channel, and I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for everybody that has contributed to Too Raw for TV. Everybody that has supported Too Raw for TV over the past year, and everybody that has supported and shown love to my channel uh, since day one. All right, so I really mean that, okay? I wanna thank everybody that in the LDBC has shown love to me over the years, you know what I'm saying, 78, Ticket TV, LB, uh, you know what I'm saying, Quest X, Town Biz, uh, 1LVZ, everybody in the LBBC uh, that has shown love, Reef, and uh, you know what I'm saying, we're still here, you know what I'm saying? I remember when all of us started making videos years and years ago, and uh, we put out, the, I think in my opinion, we put out the best content on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? Nothing watered down, nothing manufactured. You know what I'm saying? It hasn't been rehashed, reprocessed. You know what I'm saying? This is fresh, fresh, fresh from the package. So, let me get to the video. Now, I want to thank Wayne for telling me about this. All right, so on who, who's venue? All right, on Hoops Venue, they are comparing Giannis Antetokounmpo with Will Chamberlain, asking who was the better player. Okay, look. Giannis is a tremendously talented basketball player. Okay? Um, he's come a long way. He is, to me, if not the best player in the league, he's the most dominant. He's Shaq approved. He's the real goods. I love his mentality. You know what I'm saying? He has an old school mentality. I root for him. You know, as a player, and I've adopted the Milwaukee Bucks as sort of like my secondary team to root for outside of the Chicago Bulls. But I, I'm also a realist, and I tell you what I really feel. Giannis is not in the same stratosphere yet with Will Chamberlain, okay? He's not even in the same stratosphere with Patrick Ewan. Artist Gilmore. He's not even in the same discussion quite yet with Robert Parrish, in my opinion. He has not accomplished much. Okay, he does have one league MVP. He's probably on his way, you know, uh, unless the La Media have their way. He's probably on his way to his second league MVP. All right? But let me tell you this, though. Derrick Rose has a league MVP. And I don't think anybody would consider Derrick Rose a top 50, let alone a top 70 player, okay? And it's only because injuries took their toll on him. And Derrick Rose has been in the league far longer than Giannis, okay? Um, first of all, look, don't let that ESPN poll gash y'all heads up, man. Giannis is not... 27th overall in NBA history. Don't let that fucking poll gas your heads up, okay? All those fucking millennial players are all high on that list for a reason, okay? Giannis is not a top 50 overall player. I remember when... The top 50 list came out 
1996, 1997, the NBA's top 50 players at the anniversary of the 50th anniversary of the inception of the NBA. Although technically in 1946, 47, it wasn't called the NBA. It was called, uh, I think, the National uh, Basketball League. And then you had a secondary league called, well, actually the secondary league was called the National Basketball League. And the original league was called the BAA, or the Basketball Association of America. And then they combined in 1940, I think, 9, 1950, and became the NBA. But the BAA is considered the NBA. So, basically, you know, you know what I'm saying. But anyway, the point is, what the hell was my point? I went to one of those two raw fucking historical, you know, uh, Cliff Clavin type moments, and I forgot what the fuck my point was. Oh, anyway, this is the point. The point was, Shaq was put on the, the original top 50. And I remember they made a whoop de do about it. And, and, and back then, I was 16 years old, right? But I knew enough historical, I had enough historical knowledge of the NBA to realize that they were right. Like, you know, and, and this was my generation at the time. It was like, why is Shaq on this list? He hasn't done enough. And I was like, you know what? They're right. He's only played four years at the time. He's only been in the league four, going on five years. I mean, he really hadn't accomplished much. He won a scoring title. Uh, he had, you know, he took his, he helped to take his team to the NBA Finals where they were swept. Uh, but he really hadn't accomplished much. And they were talking about where were the Dominique Wilkins? On that list, where were the Alex English? Where was the Adrian Dantley's? And they were absolutely 100% correct. And the thing about Shaq, at least he won a scoring title, and at least he went to an NBA Finals in his third year. Giannis, because of James Harden, will probably never win a scoring title maybe. And he has yet to make it to the NBA Finals. And last year, they were kind of expected to go to the NBA Finals, at least favored. So to me, number 27, absolutely fucking not. He's not even top 50. Giannis, to me, if I had to guess it right now, based off accomplishments, I would put Giannis maybe in my... Top 80. Somewhere in that range right now. He has to do, he has to have a couple of more seasons of dominance to rise on that list. At least that's how I do it. I don't project what I think someone's going to do. Because injuries, whatever can happen. You know what I'm saying? So I, I go by what they've done and... I compare it to players who may not be as dominant, but have had greater uh, seasons of productivity, which can offset Giannis's dominance. Plus, also the other little trinkets that people tend to look at, championships and all that other shit, right? But let's be honest about something too, right? What's one of the things that's a weakness from Giannis? One of Giannis's weaknesses is, of course, his lack of an outside shot. He lacks an outside shot. And although this past season he's shown some improvement upon that, it's still not the best form, you know, he, he, you can look at his form of his shot release, and you can tell it's going to be one of those shots that's going to be off more than on. He might have a couple of games where he's going to hit three, four, five, three-pointers in a night, but for the most part, Giannis is going to be a typical one of five, one of six from beyond the arc type night guy. You know what I'm saying? He's just not going to be a good outside shooter. 
And I don't think he's ever really going to be a great mid-range jump shooter. Um, one of the edge, edges that Giannis has over Wilt is foul shooting. But let me say this, too. If you look at Giannis's free throw percentage over the past couple of years, they, it's dropped. At one point in time, I think Giannis was in the mid-70s when it came to his free throw percentage, which is very good for a big man. That's up there with people like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and uh, Akeem Olajuwon and Moses Malone. Moses Malone was a 76% foul shooter, which is excellent for a big man. And I think later on in Moses' career, he was consistently in the, in the 80s. All right, so, but the last couple of years, he's been dropping to 70%. 60%. Uh, I think this past year he was like 58, 59, 60%, something in that range. Now, what's causing that? Now, my theory about players when they start deteriorating from the, as far as foul shooting, I think it's two reasons. Well, three reasons. Well, technically two reasons. One of them is psychological, like in the case of a guy like Nick Anderson. And I think another instance, it's it's mechanics, all right? And I noticed that guys who weight train, centers in particular, guys who bulk up, they often fall apart substantially when it comes to their foul shooting. I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, Alonzo Mourning, when he came into the NBA with the Charlotte Hornets, he wasn't bad from the line. He, he was in the 70s. One year, if I'm not mistaken, he shot 77% from the foul line. But as Alonzo Mourning put on more and more muscle, uh, I think when he came in the league, Alonzo was like 235, 240. At his heaviest with the heat, he was 270. Okay? Then he became that terrible... But he got worse. He was more or less a 60, 63% foul shooter. Giannis has put on a lot of muscle. And I think it has something to do with his mechanics. Wilt got worse. Wilt's an example of this. Wilt, when he first came to the NBA, was a 60, 60%, 62%, 64% foul shooter. As Wilt got stronger and stronger, his free throw touch got worse and worse. And worse. And Wilt started like actually camping out three, four feet from the foul line to try to get some type of touch from the line, but nothing worked. He even did the sissy Rick Berry grandma underhand free throw. Didn't work. All right. But other than that, all right, Wilt has distinct advantages over Giannis. Accomplishments. All right. As dominant as Giannis has been, Wilt is the most dominant player in the history of the NBA. I don't care about the era and all that shit. He's the most dominant player in the history of the NBA. Because I'm going to tell you something, too, though, about that thing about him not having a lot of competition at the same position. It's not true. It's not true when people say that. Because when Wilt played, Arguably, he played in the era with the greatest competition of centers. Because not only did you have Wilt, you had Bill Russell, you had Nate Thurman, you had Willis Reed, you had Artis Gilmore, you had Zelmo Beatty before he left and went to the ABA, you had Bob Lanier, Big Bob Lanier, you had Walt Bellamy, all right? And that right there is already seven or eight quality big men. Wes Unseld, Elvin Hayes. They're already right there is probably eight or nine to ten quality big men in a league where there's only 14 to 17 teams. So it wasn't even like the 90s when there was only five quality big men in a league with 25, 27 teams. So I don't understand why people have this perception 
that Will Chamberlain. Now, if you're talking about the early to mid '60s, you got a case. But the mid to late '60s and the '70s, Will played against the best center uh, competition in the history of the league. And of course, I'm leaving some guys out. You know. Um. So when it comes to competition. Wilt has the advantage. When it comes to domination, statistically, Wilt has the advantage. Wilt still probably holds, I think, something like 70-plus NBA records. Uh, his career average is 30 points, 23 rebounds. We don't know how many blocks, but it's a god-awful total. 4.4 assists. All right. Giannis holds an advantage in field goal percentage. He does hold an advantage in free throw percentage. But, Wilt won two NBA championships. Wilt won four league MVPs. And remember, Wilt missed the entire season. Basically, the entire season, 1969, 1970, to an injury that ended most people's careers. So who knows what he could have done or have accomplished if he was able to play that one more season. And if he was able to play that one more season, you know, how high would he be on the NBA's uh, scoring list? What was part of two of the greatest NBA championship teams of all time? The 1967-76ers and the 72 Los Angeles Lakers, two of the greatest teams in the history of the league. And Wilt Chamberlain had a lot to do with that. Despite the fact that there's this perception that Bill Russell kicked Wilt Chamberlain's ass, it's not really true. If you look at the actual breakdown of the games, I think Russell holds a small margin uh, advantage. Uh, it often took a team effort to slow down Wilt. By that, I mean spies, uh, you know, uh, help defense. It took a lot to slow down Wilt Chamberlain. Bill Russell once said that he could not really guard Wilt. Like, I know one thing he said is you couldn't guard Wilt Chamberlain the same way every game because it wouldn't work. He would figure out what you were going to do defensively and he would take advantage of that. Bill Russell is considered one of the great, if not the greatest defensive player in the history of the league. And Wilt Chamberlain averaged 29 points and 29 rebounds against Bill Russell, including having a 62-point game against Bill Russell and also establishing an all-time NBA record with 55 rebounds in a game against Bill Russell. People need to start putting more respect on this man's name. Okay. He's no longer here to give you the, the stories. Many people who are his teammates are no longer here to tell you uh, how dominant this man was. This is a guy who, in an NBA game, played against a guy that was a dominant player in the 1960s and into the 1970s name, Gus Johnson, nicknamed Honeycomb. He's played with the then Baltimore Bullets. And there was a game where, and Gus Johnson was known for being a, a physical force. He was sort of like a, a Charles Barkley prototype, but without the fat, you know, without any fat on his body. He was 6'6", 235 pounds. I mean, huge for the era he played in. Very strong, powerful guy, you know. His game was sort of similar a little bit to maybe like a, a Scotty Pippen but with power. He, he, he's sort of like mixing... It, it, it'll be like his game was sort of like taking Barkley's physicality and rebound ability and Pippen's playmaking ability. All right? But there was a game where Gus Johnson attempted to dunk over Will Chamberlain which is something nobody did, dare try to do. And he was warned 
my will not to try to do that. Well, Gus Johnson, being young and naive, attempted to dunk over Will Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain blocked Gus Johnson's shot so ferociously and so fiercely that Gus Johnson went down to the hardwood floor so hard that his shoulder dislocated from his body. Bob Lanier once said that he was trying to get uh, he's playing up against uh, playing against Wilt on what was with the Lakers. And Wilt was trying to get position in the post against Bob Lanier. Right? I guess he was trying to I don't know, I guess maybe somebody like Goodridge or West was trying to give him an entry pass. But he couldn't get the position that he wanted. So Bob Lanier said that when the ref wasn't looking, Will Chamberlain simply picked him up and moved him out the way. Like picked him up by the seat of his jersey. His pants, I should say. Picked him up and then moved him out the way and then was able to get the position for the score, right? Bob Lanier was 7'2", 270 pounds. Wilt was a fierce guy, man. Wilt came into the NBA averaging 38 points, 27 rebounds, won seven consecutive NBA scoring championships, decided to change the way he played. He could have won more scoring championships. He won 11 rebounding titles in his 13 years of playing. Well, 14 years, if you consider that a boarded season. Probably would have led the league in 12 of those 14 seasons if he didn't get injured that one season where Elvin Hayes led the NBA in rebound. Will Chamberlain, up until the dawn of this uh, century, was often considered the GOAT, along with Kareem and then sometimes Mike. I don't know what has caused Wilt to falter as much as he has. But I'm telling you something, I'm beginning to see it starting to happen with Kareem. And it is this phasing out of the big man. Historically, I'm even starting to see this. I'm starting to see Wilt follow people's top tens. I'm seeing Shaq follow the people's top tens. We've seen it with the recent poll for Kim Olajuwon. Kareem's fallen. Dan Robertson's not in, in, in a lot of people's top 25. Patrick Ewan's not even in a lot of people's top 50s. The center position is being just looked over and glossed over as a position with guys who just are big and, you know, they don't have much skill and, you know, and, you know it's not much to it. They're not as important as the perimeter guys. Well, let me tell you this. Without the rebound, how the fuck are you going to get the ball? Will Chamberlain, to me, is a top five all-time player. Maybe some people have a little bit lower than that. But to me, Will is at least top five. And in many people's eyes, he's still the GOAT. And to have him compared to a guy who's only had three years of statistical dominance is an insult. And I think a lot of millennials need to start showing some of these guys a little bit more respect and do a little bit more research when it comes to uh, ranking players all time. 
It's a tough thing to do because you do got to take stats and errors and pace. You, you, you do got to take all these things into um, consideration. But I do know this. Will Chamberlain, when he was at his scoring best, had a jump shot. Uh, Will Chamberlain had a jump shot. Will Chamberlain had a fallaway jumper. Uh, he had a bank shot. And he had range out to about 16 or 17 feet, which is why uh, and he was more of a finesse player when he was with the Warriors, which is why his field goal percentage was a little, little bit lower when he was a volume scorer because he wasn't always – in the paint scoring. He wanted to display. Remember, he came out of uh, the Globetrotters, where he developed all of these skills, and he wanted to showcase his game. He didn't want to just be this brute that just dunked the ball all the time, which he kind of became toward the end of his career with the Lakers. But that's for other reasons. So I've studied Will Chamberlain's game, you know what I'm saying, and, and his career. Will, one time... Let me, end this, let me end this video on this, on this, right? Wilt was so highly sought after. I remember in the early 1980s, I remember reading about this. Uh, the Lakers talked about this. Magic, uh, James Worthy and those guys. They said that one time there was a scrimmage that the Showtime Lakers were holding. And this was, uh, this might have been around 1980. Two or 1983. So Wilt was about 46 years old. And they, you know, uh, invited Wilt to come join them in the scrimmage. And initially, Wilt was kind of playing for fun. You know, he wasn't really playing as hard as he could have, you know. So somebody like Magic Johnson or something said, to the effect of, good thing you, you retired when you did, Will, like an old man. Something like that. You know, you look like an old man. Something, a flip, a switch flipped in Will Chamberlain. And it said for the rest of the practice, until he stopped playing, every shot, every shot, every layup, every shot that contested the realm, Will Chamberlain block every single shot. And Wilt was so highly sought after that even when he was 50 years old, he was offered, offered a contract by the New Jersey Nets when he was 50 years old. So, no. He's not in the same league, same stratosphere, Giannis, as Wilt, yet. Let Giannis tell his story, stop being impatient, let his career progress, and then 10, 12 years from now, then we can assess his career, and we'll see if he's at or above what Wilt did for his career.